Welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this Good Friday time together. Really looking forward to spending this time remembering the amazing work that Jesus did for us on the cross. Uh, just an announcement for Sunday. I am hoping on the live stream to do a little communion service as part of the main Easter Sunday morning service. So if you'd like to get bread in your homes and some juice, some squash, um, you're more than welcome. So if you can have that ready for Sunday, we're going to try and do that as part of the service. Uh, so you can take that and join in together. We're going to have a reading now before we start, just to remember what Jesus has done. And we're going to pray and then there'll be a, a video clip. Then I'm going to preach and then there'll be a couple of songs afterwards, all in one video. So you don't need to click any other links. Just keep playing this and follow along till the end. Well, the reading is from Mark chapter 15. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Father, we pray as we remember and see how Jesus died, that we would cry out, surely Jesus is our Lord, surely he is the Son of God, surely he is our Saviour. Lord, please be with us in this time. Please lift us up and help us to trust in Jesus, we pray. Amen.
For our Good Friday reading, we're going to read from Luke chapter 22 and from verse 39. If you've got a Bible there, please feel free to turn to it and have a look. If not, just follow along. I'm going to read the passage nice and clearly. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Father, we pray that this Good Friday you would talk to us. Please help us to see how Jesus is the answer to everything we see around us, everything we're hearing around us, that he is the answer. Please speak to our hearts now, we pray. Amen. Well, the disciples were exhausted, exhausted from sorrow. They've been under so much pressure They followed Jesus everywhere and they were tired out, they were sleeping, they were exhausted. I wonder if you've been feeling the pressure from this coronavirus, the pressure that it's produced, the pressure that it's it's generated. Everyone has felt that pressure, everyone's felt the exhaustion and the sorrow, whether you've suffered from the illness or whether you haven't suffered. We've all felt the effects, all felt the pressure, and it's been a huge amount of pressure, huge burdens to carry, huge effects on people's physical health, mental health, all these different things. 
families have felt it. Maybe you've been at home with the kids, you've been trying to find things for them to do, trying to get their schoolwork done, trying to manage them to do whatever they, it is they need to do. Maybe you've been trying to juggle them and work yourselves working from home. And it's a huge amount of pressure trying to get enough food in so everyone has a meal to eat. Businesses have felt it. Felt the pressure of what do I do with my employees? What do I do with all these people that we're providing for? Do we pay them? Do we put them on furlough? Do we just have to lay people off? Do we have to shut entirely? Businesses wondering whether they will ever open again or not. They felt intense pressure. Banks have felt pressure. Pressure from people phoning and queuing up asking for loans, millions of pounds having to be found from nowhere, it seems, to help people in this time. They felt under pressure, right up to the highest place in the government. They're feeling the pressure too. Pressure to make difficult decisions, trying to weigh every situation up, trying to do the best for everybody, for vulnerable people, people who are older at home on their own, whoever it might be. There's been lots of emergency meetings and phone calls. They're feeling the pressure. And then hospitals as well, spilling over, not having the numbers of beds that they need, not having the right equipment to be able to help and treat people. Everyone's scrambling to work, to make it on time, just to be able to help people in this suffering. And it's been heartbreaking, I'm sure you'll agree, to see videos and hear nurses just breaking their hearts, exhausted from sorrow. They're feeling the pressure, being asked to care for people when there's not really any cure that's known for this virus. They're feeling the pressure. People's mental health sometimes is cracking and there's cracks appearing in our government, hospitals, systems, everywhere, threatened to be torn apart. And then maybe worst of all, the relatives and friends and family of people who've suffered from the virus, who are really ill in hospital and they're not even allowed to go and visit. And then those who've lost their lives, the families and friends, it feels so heartbreaking. A huge amount of pressure on every part of society brought by something so small we can't even see it. Well, you would say, who would choose that pressure? It's so exhausting. It's so stretching. It threatens to tear so much apart. And maybe you feel torn apart inside today. No one would, in their right mind, would choose this pressure, would they? Well, the disciples wouldn't. But Jesus did. We find Jesus here under an insane amount of pressure not being pressured to do something, but under pressure because of what he's about to do. He's feeling the weight of everything. Literally, the whole world is on his shoulders. The words here are really strong. He was in anguish, in agony. He prayed and he was working so hard, his sweat fell to the floor like drops of blood. Blood was mixed in with his sweat and it was dropping to the floor. Jesus was under an insane amount of pressure because of what he was about to do coming up to Good Friday. He was feeling the weight of all of history on his shoulders. All the world's sin, every lie, every mistake, Every act of stubbornness, every murder, every act of lust and greed and selfishness that this world has ever known through all history, Jesus was taking onto himself. We can hardly stand it, can we? When someone blames us for doing something wrong, oh, you did that and we were innocent. We can hardly stand it. We crack. We tear up, don't we? We, I have to say something. I have to justify myself. It wasn't me. I'm innocent. I didn't do that. I don't deserve to suffer. 
And that's exactly how Jesus was. He was innocent himself. The Bible says he committed no sin ever at one second in his life. He never thought anything wrong. He never did anything wrong. He never said anything wrong. And yet he is now feeling the pressure of all of the sin of all of history. Every person who's ever lived, all the guilt is falling on him. And he chooses to suffer in this way. He is feeling the guilt and the shame of everyone who's ever lived. People who can't live with themselves because of the things they've done and said. Jesus is feeling the weight and the pressure of that. People who carry on living with themselves despite doing terrible things and it doesn't seem to bother them. Selfishness and wickedness. And they can't see it because of a hard heart. Jesus is taking all their guilt, all their blame, all their punishment, mine and yours, onto himself. He's facing the punishment of it all. He's about to taste death and hell for everyone who's ever lived. What pressure. Enough to make us crack. Enough to tear us apart. Maybe it does tear you apart inside your own sin. But Jesus faced up to this in the Garden of Gethsemane that night leading up to Good Friday. He sees what's ahead of him on the cross and he's in anguish. He's wrestling in prayer for help from God. It's like he says, oh, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, Father. But there's no other way and he knows it. And in the end, he comes to this conclusion. He says, not my will, but your will be done, Father. Your will be done. He chooses this way, chooses this anguish, chooses this agony, chooses this suffering. Why? To save you and to save me. God has found a way through the cross to rescue guilty people whilst being just and fair and punishing for sin. Only he is going to come and pay himself this time. Not us trying to pay our sins off. That's an impossible debt, the Bible says. It takes the blood of God to wash us clean. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to come and do. Rescue guilty people. And he's feeling the pressure of that guilt, that embarrassment, that shame, that death he's starting to taste. God is starting to die because of our sin and it's creating this huge amount of anguish in Jesus. But he's doing it to bring a cure to a terrible disease that has a hundred percent death rate in us all. Sin that's at work in my heart and at work in your heart and at work in everyone's hearts. All of sin, the Bible says, and falls short of the glory of God. But Jesus has worked on this amazing cure, a cure that's for anyone of any time. But the pressure of it is extreme. But it gives the answer to where is God in all of this? You might be reading the news, listening, reading the papers, seeing other people suffer. You might be asking that question, where is God in all of this now? Where is he if he's there, if he's a God who loves and he cares? Where is he? Well, to get the answer to that question, you need to see where he was before all this, knowing it would all happen. Jesus hangs on the cross on Good Friday, right in the middle of it all. He's surrounded by people who are mocking, people who are joking, people who are living lives that are just the same as before, gambling and being selfish. And what does he pray? He says, Father, forgive them. He prays with his very life his, as his blood is spilling out, as he's nailed to the cross. He prays with his very life, Father, forgive them. 
for they don't know what they're doing. And, and, he, and then he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This intense suffering, this intense pressure, this taking everyone's guilt and shame nearly tears God apart. The relationship that Jesus has had with his father for all eternity, for that second, is torn apart. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The pain in his heart and the darkness that he feels as he takes the punishment for all of the world's sin. Your sin and my sin is so extreme. He is suffering. He is bleeding. He is struggling to breathe. And he is suffering and dying for you, friend. Not just for a temporary fix. Not just for something that will help for now. But an answer that will help forever. An answer that brings you and me eternal life. So that no matter what happens here, we are safe in Jesus' arms. And he cried out as he suffered on the cross just before he died. It is finished. Literally, it is paid for. The whole world sins. Everyone who's ever lived, he has paid on the cross for their sins. To bring about this cure to the most deadly disease. What pressure Jesus felt and he died under that pressure. Does God understand what we're facing? He does. Does he understand the pain You're trying to come to terms with. He does. Does he understand all the pressure of trying to arrange everything in the world every day? He does. And he understands you. Jesus has suffered the most horrible death to save you, friend. You see, Jesus' vision is deeper and wider and higher than anyone has gone before. His work can rescue everyone through all of history. His power can save whoever, wherever, whenever. His hand can shield and protect you no matter what. The hope he gives is not based on anyone else's promise but his own. The joy he gives is not affected by any amount of suffering. The security he offers is forever. The life he gives is everlasting. The forgiveness he offers is not for a few mistakes. It's for a whole lifetimes of sin and shame paid for in this terrible death and suffering that Jesus faced alone. The peace that he offers you today through his death is not temporary but a peace that can last forever. No matter what's going on around you or outside you in the world or even in your own heart and mind, Jesus can give peace, not this peace that's very tentative, that hangs in the balance, a peace that's been paid for forever by his own blood for you, between you and God, between you and others, between even you and yourself. He has been tempted in every way and yet he didn't sin. What an amazing saviour. He is able to sympathise with you in every situation because he's become one of us and he's lived our life. Everything we've ever had to face, Jesus has faced before us and he was willing to step into the most dark, loneliest place, a place of agony and anguish on the cross so that he can stand there with you and save you. Save you from death and give you life that lasts forever. To put you right with God. To pay for your forgiveness. The Bible says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. Imagine for a moment that someone came up with a cure for the virus that's causing so much pressure. Wouldn't you pay anything to get it? 
Wouldn't you give anything to be safe, for your friends and family and loved ones to be safe and saved forever? What about if someone offered that cure to you for free? We'd all jump at the chance, wouldn't we? I know I would jump at the chance to get that. And yet Jesus has provided a cure for the most deadly disease that's affected everyone since the beginning of time. He's paid for our sins with his own blood. Friend, why won't you give up anything you have to get Jesus? It's called Good Friday because what Jesus did on the cross is good news for you. He has paid for all your sins. He's tasted your death, been through every bit of suffering. He's been forsaken and alone, so you never have to face that. Will you give up your sin? Will you give up any old way of life and attitude to get Jesus? He gave up everything for you, friend. And if you're a Christian and you know Jesus is forgiveness, you know you have this hope that lasts forever, look at him. He's already given you the cure for everything. He's given you eternal life. He's given you a home in heaven. One day he's coming back to make this world again. A new heavens and a new earth where there'll be no more suffering, no more pain, no more darkness, no more isolation, no more lockdown, just complete freedom and life and joy with no threat of any illness or death, no more pain or tears. And on Good Friday, he paid the great price to make that possible for you to have a place. So Christian, he says to you, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, Jesus says. Trust also in me. In my Father's house in heaven, there are many rooms. And I go there, go through this agony, through the cross, rising to life after, to prepare a place for you. And if I go ahead of you to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am, in that place of paradise. Friend, if you're listening today, and you're not a Christian, and you feel the pressure of everything around you, the pressure of your own heart, the pressure of your past life, your sin, know this, that Jesus has come and has paid to provide you with a cure, to be washed clean on the inside, to be made new. Why won't you give up everything you have to know him today? Call on his name, trust in him, and be saved. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you were willing to suffer on the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't just give temporary fixes or a little bit of relief. Thank you, you've come to give life and life to the full that lasts forever. And thank you, Jesus, you're willing to go through such anguish and suffering and pressure to save sinners like me, to save sinners like all of us. Lord Jesus, please help us to see how complete this solution is that you've given. Help us to love you for it, for it, Lord, for the price you paid, for the blood you spilled. Help us to trust you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. For your glory's sake we ask. Amen.
I know that there are people watching this video and in this room who are not trusting Jesus Christ and therefore can only expect condemnation. And so I'm just going to plead with you. Lay down that rebellion. Lay it down. And simply embrace the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Righteous One, died for your sins. He was raised on the third day, triumphant over all His enemies. He reigns until He puts all of His enemies under His feet. Forgiveness of sins and a right standing with God comes freely through Him alone, by faith alone. Yeah. 
Yeah.